welcome to season two of The Buzz. My name is Susie Lytle. I'm a program coordinator with the Forest Preserve District of Will County. And today we're gonna to be exploring the structures left behind at the Joliet Ironworks historic site. Then we're gonna be taking a trip over to Rock Run Rookery where reports of bald eagles have been going wild. So get ready for an adventure on this episode of The Buzz. Joliet has the nickname of the City of Steel and Stone, and today we're going to figure out how exactly it got that name. We're here at Joliet Ironworks historic site, and it used to be a bustling factory in the 1900s. Then it got covered with thick vegetation, and now it's preserved ruins. We're going to be exploring today with interpretive naturalist Sarah Russell, who's going to be answering all of our questions about the history of the site and what work was done here. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful day. Um, we're out here and we're walking these trails and what exactly are we looking at? This is one of my favorite sites, so it's wonderful for everyone to get a chance to come out and see these footprints of what used to be the Joliet Ironworks. Joliet Ironworks is the name that we say for this collective of different companies that worked here. So they were different iron and steel industries. It was built and started in the 1870s, and it continued full force through the 1930s. Most of the site was disbanded at that time, and even though they continued to do some finishing work afterwards, uh, it was not continued as a full site where we're making steel and iron. Thing, if you come here, it almost looks like you're in some ancient archeological dig. But instead, what you're seeing is just the base of something from the 19th and 20th centuries uh, from the iron industry. Uh, they took everything with them when they left or sold it because it's all really valuable. Sure. Which means all we have left is the footprints. When the Forest Preserve got it in the early 90s, uh, it was just kind of all completely overgrown. So we actually did have some archeologists who came out and they had to kind of pull back the weeds and then cover what was underneath. Well, they get to learn about what it was like to be a worker at this plant with all the different jobs and what it entailed. And in fact, we're not gonna just let you come back and sit back and enjoy. We actually have jobs for you to do. So everyone gets a job card and I figured today, Susie, I would hand one over to you as well. Here you go. This is great. I love that I'm connecting with this site by getting a job and I won't dive into details quite yet, but I'm a stock house shoveler. So can't wait to see what that's all about. Let's dig deeper into the history and go way back in time. And Sarah, tell me what this plant was used for. Like what's the goal? What's the end product? So at Joliet Ironworks, uh, what we're working on and making is metal. So it's iron, okay. and then later on it's steel. All right, two different metals. Two different iron metals, okay. but you need iron in order to make steel. All right, you had to have a couple different kinds of materials. You had to have the iron ore, which is that this. rock that you're holding here. It's okay. pretty heavy, right? You right, it is heavy. Yeah. It's not a normal like rock. It's right. shiny, it's right. got weight to it. Yeah. So it's actually a mineral, right, that comes up from the ground. But you can't just use that have to add two other ingredients. You need limestone, which Joliet is famous for, right? Uh, so this is the stone in the steel and stone. Yes, this Got is the it. stone part. And then the other thing that you have to have is something called Coke. <laughs> not the drink, Coke. Yeah. not the drug. <laughs> this is actually like um, a charcoal briquette, basically. Right, coal for like coal, your barbecue. Right, exactly. Coal from your barbecue, that's what it is. So you have to have all those three ingredients. And I think we're actually coming up to your job. I'm a stock house shoveler and top filler. So I put the raw materials like limestone, coke, and our iron ore into wheelbarrows. And then after a long ride up, you said those are like 100 feet tall, we put them in the furnace. The reason for that is that cooking process happens in the middle of this giant furnace. That's this great big tube. Behind us is where the furnace would be, correct? Right. You have to pump hot air in. Once you do all that, then you can get everything mixes and melds together and it creates the iron. You actually have the iron that you want, it's kind of in the middle. And then on top of that, you have kind of the, the slack. You're gonna have to drain that off. Okay. And in fact, 
That's what you're seeing behind us. This is oh. some leftover schmutz, which we call slag. So this is actually called a, it's a giant salamander. The salamander right here is the archeological footprint that's been left behind. So we have our iron ore, the limestone, and the coke in the furnace. It's heating up, it's molten lava. How do we get it out? Really important, right? We have to do that. So basically, we've got this really, really hot lava we have to get out, and it's somebody's job to do it. So you have somebody called a clay buster who takes this magnificently long um, wooden stick, right? okay, and they take it and they just jam it at the cork, and that pops it off. Some of the later furnaces that came in a little bit later on, they had new technology. These are up higher when you come out here. At these, you actually had these big ladle cars that would pull right on up to it, and they could collect uh, the iron. However, earlier, guys, when they were at the beginning of our site, mm -hmm. they actually had a more difficult task. They had this great big sandbox. Basically, you've got this great big ice cube tray that's made out of sand. Um, and what happens is that when the iron gets busted out of the furnaces, it lays into the sand and it kind of starts to dry and harden up like an ice cube tray. Uh, but the catch is you can't let it get too hard too fast because then you have this giant mass of iron on the ground. Right, you can't like just crack <laughs> yeah. it like an ice cube yeah. tray is. So you have somebody in charge of that, right? You've got a pig iron laborer. So they would actually take sticks again, or metal, metal sticks, and they would bust open out the, um, the pig iron. And it's called that because it's kind of long and oval and it looks almost like a baby pig leg. Now don't move a muscle. We're gonna take a short break and then come back to learn about the dangers of the job. Winter is in full swing. Beat that cabin fever by embracing it and eating up everything the season has to offer. There's no shortage of wildlife to see when you take it slow. Or pick up the pace and let your furry friends run wild at one of six dog parks. Hit our sled hill and brace yourself for glorious wipeouts. Find a spot to enjoy a moment of winter's end. You can also give snowshoeing a shot. Or maybe cross-country skiing is more your thing. The choice is yours. Welcome back to Joliet Iron Works. We're here with Sarah Russell, our interpretive naturalist, who's been giving us a little tour. And I'm looking at my job card here, and I'm a little concerned. Um, there's a danger part, and I'll read it off for you. Dangers were intense heat or poisonous gas released to possibly overwhelm workers as they fall to their death or outside the furnace they fall. So Sarah, this is pretty intense. What kind of dangers did these workers face on day to day? You're dropping um, all of these materials in, but sometimes those poisonous gases come back up and you get carbon monoxide poisoning, basically. You can fall off the side, right, of your of that 70 foot height. Furnace, yeah. Or you could fall right in it and you become part of the product that you have spent all of your time, all your days making. They didn't want to lose workers, right? It wasn't their goal to see how many they could go through. They wanted to protect them. Uh, so they were actually part of one of the first safety first movements uh, where they were trying to print signs in the languages that people spoke and tried to get them trained properly and made them aware of, of some of the dangers. So they, you know, would actually create um, platforms themselves. They would put um, wood on their shoes to kind of get them a little bit away from the heat, right? They would have to be wearing these protective clothing and stuff. Um, and it wasn't always provided by, by the site, by the plant.
Thank you, Sarah, for joining us. I loved hearing all your knowledge. And I know I appreciate the city of Steel and Stone so much more now. I think Joliet Ironworks is a great place to learn about a human story, plus a manufacturing wonder, and be surrounded by nature. So if the public wants to experience this site more, what can they do? Well, uh, definitely come out to this site here, explore it with friends or family, and then come to Isle Alakash Museum. We've got an exhibit coming up on the manufacturing here and the people who work here. And you can also check out our website, reconnectwithnature.org, to learn about upcoming virtual and in-person tours. Winter is a great time to look at who moved into the tree next door. Usually the trees are full of leaves covering nests from hungry predators. But now that the leaves have fallen, you can see who that nest belonged to. Now generally these nests are going to be empty. Usually the rule is that they're nesting in spring, laying eggs, taking care of their young, and then once the birds are old enough to fly away, the whole family moves out. Nests can be made out of lots of different materials, from sticks, leaves, grass, even lichen from trees. This is a robin's nest. This is a common one you can see around your house. It may not even be in a tree. It's made out of mud, sticks, and grasses. Next is a Baltimore Orioles nest. You can see that this one's more cup-shaped. And the small one belongs to a ruby-throated hummingbird. It's tiny, made out of mosses, lichen, and hold together by spider webs. Now nests aren't just for birds. You may also notice something like this. This is a bald face hornet nest, and it's made more out of paper. The bees will eat wood material, mix it with their saliva to make this sheddy paper look. Now inside the nest still looks like the classic honeycomb uh, pattern we're used to seeing with the honeybees. These nests are rebuilt every year and are abandoned, usually during the winter. Birds tend to destroy these looking for a meal left inside. Squirrels also make nests. Theirs are called drays. And you can look up in the trees and find a big ball of messy leaves and sticks. That's a squirrel's nest. And in a cold winter day like today, chances are they're bundled inside, keeping warm. So embrace the great outdoors this winter. Look high, look low, look even inside the trees. See how many nests and animal homes you can find. Our national bird has been spotted in our forest preserves. We're here at Rock Run Rookery where we've had reports of bald eagles all month long. Now bald eagles have had their struggles, being hunted to protect fishing holes, but then also battling against pesticides like DDT. They have been put on the endangered species list. But they are a success story. Starting from 400 breeding pairs in the lower 48 states, now they count up to approximately 1,400 pairs. So with protection and all of us working together, the bald eagles have made a comeback. Before the Forest Preserve acquired Rock Run Rookery, it was first created as a quarry. Now fast forward, we use this area for nesting herons, fishing, and recreation. And in the past few years, it's been one of the best places in Will County to see bald eagles. So if you're looking for the bald eagles, here's some tips. You can start out at the observation deck and maybe get lucky to see one or two. You can also scan the trees along Route 6 or walk all the way down to the other end of the preserve where the trail ends. Now make sure you pack a spine scope, binoculars, or even a long camera lens because you can see them with the naked eye, but they'll be kind of little blobs and the juveniles blend in. So grab your equipment for a better look. Being the most abundant in Canada and Alaska, the bald eagle is only found in North America. They like to live near water where fish are plentiful. You can find them all throughout Will County, but we do have some hot spots. You may want to check out Four Rivers Environmental Education Center in Shanahan, Wallen Lake in Naperville, Lake Renrick in Plainfield, and here, one of our best spots, 
Rock Run, Rookery, and Joliet. Bald eagles are normally solitary birds, but as the temperatures drop, your chances of seeing one or more in action increase. This is because when the lakes and rivers freeze over, the eagles tend to congregate in the areas that are left unfrozen. We think Rock Run Rookery is a good place because of its proximity to the Des Plaines River and there's plenty of food to go around. There have been certain days when we see photographers come out here and get pictures of six to seven eagles all in one tree. I bet you can picture these majestic birds swooping down the water, catching a fish with their powerful talons, which is a common sight. But did you know these bald eagles also steal fish from other birds? Sometimes they'll go to lengths to chase them down until the meal is up for grabs, dropped on the ground. They can handle about five pounds to fly off with. But if the fish is too heavy, bald eagles are known to swim by rowing their wings until they reach a better place to eat. They're also not very picky eaters. So they've been known to grab rabbits, frogs, really anything that they can carry. They're also fans of eating carrion, which is another word for dead animals. So that sounds pretty delicious. It may not surprise you that bald eagles aren't actually bald. So they have white feathers on their heads and tails with a dark body and yellow feet and yellow beak. So what's the deal with all those brown eagles? Well, they're immatures. It actually takes five years to grow that iconic look. So the young eagles start with more brown speckles all over and a darker beak. As they get older, they'll start changing out their feathers, getting lighter in the head and darker in the body. However, they can be a little confusing with other hawks and eagles, so make sure to keep in mind this awkward preteen phase. Bald eagles are a pretty impressive looking bird. They stand up to be three feet tall with a wingspan of six to eight feet. And females are a little bit larger than males. Now like all birds, they have hollow bones, but they can get up to 14 pounds. So imagine holding a gallon of paint. It's about the same weight. When they fly, they can go 30 miles per hour. And then when they dive, 100 miles per hour. That would land us humans with a pretty hefty speeding ticket. While in flight, Look for the biggest bird in the sky. Usually I can tell the white head and the white tail, but if you can't, look at the wings. They have straight wings that are like flat rectangles. Other birds that can be confused are turkey vultures, which fly with their wings in a V shape, and ospreys that make more of an M shape. Stick around. Now that we've learned where these animals are and what they look like, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to learn what the bald eagles sound like and more cool adaptations. Do you hear that? Now don't be fooled by Hollywood's depiction of the bald eagle's call. A lot of times they use the more intimidating scream of the red-tailed hawk. But bald eagles actually have a more softer pitch whistling call. Personally, I think it sounds like they're being tickled and they're just giggling until they can't handle it any longer. Have you heard the term eagle eye, usually used to describe someone with great eyesight and observation? Well, bald eagles are no exception. They have pretty big eyes, actually the same size of eyes that we have. Theirs takes up the most of their whole head. They can spot things further, sharper, and wider than we can. 
Say we see a fire two miles away, well they can actually see a mouse run away from that fire. Bald eagles mate for life, which can be about 20 to 30 years. They both help making the nest out of sticks and then grasses and feathers for a cozy inside. Now these nests can be huge. They add on to it every year, doing little renovations each nesting season. So picture like a queen size bed that's five feet wide and two to four feet deep. And make sure you look at those nests closely. You never know what you're gonna find. We personally have found a great horn owl overtake an eagle's nest because, well, they're terrible nest builders. So why not move into a bald eagle's nest? We know it's super exciting to find a nest, but the Forest Preserve District of Will County never discloses a nest location. And this is to protect the birds. Any human disturbance can make them stressed out and abandon the nest. It's a good rule of thumb to stand about a football field away from these birds. If the bird is reacting to you, then you're too close. Once a rare sight, bald eagles can now be spotted close to home. We are so lucky to see them here at Rock Run Rookery, but there's still some things we can do to help them out. Actions like removing lead from your hunting and fishing equipment. Lead actually poisons the fish and returns the predators that eat them, like our eagles. Another easy thing to do is to keep the waterways clean by disposing trash and your fishing line properly. With these easy actions, we can protect all the habitats and these amazing birds. So what are you waiting for? It's your turn to plan your adventure, come out to Rock Run Rookery, scan the trees, check the water, and don't forget to look up. Thank you so much for joining us today. From our industrial history to our nation's mascot's natural history, I hope you learned something new about your local forest preserves. Now map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org for the latest in wildlife information, trail updates, and upcoming programs near you. I hope to see you out exploring, but until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.